Hi, this is Steve Cirilletti. I'm a resident of Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and I'm here to introduce Eva Costello. She is a naturalized citizen from Venezuela, and she's been fighting for immigrants' rights for over 41 years. Eva won the Americanism Award from the Daughters of the Revolution in 2015, and her name of her program is Immigration 101. Please, please welcome Eva Costello. Hello, my name is Eva Castillo. Uh, I'm coming here today to present the Immigration 101. I put this presentation together uh, as a help for many of the people that have become my partners and allies that not necessarily know what immigration is all about and our current laws. So these are all based on our current immigration law and hopefully you'll learn a little bit of how we got to where we are right now. So let's go with the slides. Okay, so this is a very short condensed version of the people's timeline well, comprising the main immigration uh, laws or happenings uh, in, in our country. So in 1924, uh, they put the first limitation on, on uh, immigration. So the visa system was introduced and a quota, uh, and quota system. In 1965, they put a, the national origin quota system was repealed and family reunification was given a priority. So this is the main form of immigration that we have right now. In 1986, President Reagan signed the bill giving, um, giving amnesty to roughly three million people that were here undocumented and also instituted penalties for people that hired undocumented immigrants. But he failed to revamp the rest of the, the immigration laws and ways to immigrate here legally. Then in 1996, President Clinton signed a bill expanding deportable offenses People without documentation, now they have to return to their countries of origin and then apply to come back from here. Uh, they have to wait up to 10 years before they are allowed to immigrate to the US. And this has been the last major piece of immigration legislation. Next. So these are the ways to immigrate to the country now. And when I say immigrate, is to come live here and work here. So as a refugee, asylum seeker, work, lottery visas, and the family reunification. So next. So who's an immigrant refugee? People whose own government cannot or would not protect them. These are people that are persecuted for religion or for political beliefs. They're fled genocide or brutalized for military regimes. Right now, there are 65.5 65 million refugees in the world. The US will welcome 30,000 refugees uh, in 2019, this is down from 80,000 refugees that we were set to uh, cap to receive in this country for this year. Okay, so asylum seekers are people have, that are fleeing the same conditions that refugees are. They're being persecuted due to maybe their religious beliefs, their political beliefs, uh, or they have well-founded uh, fear of persecution. They must apply within one year of entering the U.S. So the main difference between refugees and asylees is that refugees apply from outside of the country. They are vetted, and we bring them here to our country already uh, with all their paperwork and with the status of refugees. Asylees, the way it is now, uh, have, they come to the country, and once they're here, they apply uh, for, this, for the status they have to uh, a window of uh, 12 months to apply for status. Okay, so the next slide. So immigrant workers, there are different uh, categories of visas that would, al uh, that would allow work, uh, people to come and work here, but those are usually, uh, the, the, the company applies for and to bring the workers here and they have, they have a high set of standards. They have to prove that they cannot find an American do, that can do that particular job and they are bound to uphold their rights and they, they do the whole process, the company itself, so the worker is tied 
to the companies. There, there are several different visa categories in that, in that uh, regard. So the next slide uh, is the visa lottery, and we have heard some of that lately in the news too. So every year the U.S. puts 50,000 uh, visas available there, and people just apply uh, for them. So as you can see, uh, there's in, 19, in 2009, there were 9.1 million applicants for the visa. But last year, in 2017, there were 19 million people applying for this, those 50,000 visas. And they give you, you know, if you're one of the lucky winners, you can come here and they give you your permanent residency and you can work and live here uh, in peace. The next visa, the next category, next slide please, uh, is the immigrant family members. So U.S. citizens can petition for their spouses, their parents, their children, including those that are married and their siblings. Legal permanent residents can petition for their spouse and their minor unmarried children. Okay, so this is uh, where we have a little bit of a problem. Where, uh, go to the next slide and I'll show you. Uh, so for immigrant visa issues, there's 226,000 visas available for the family sponsored preference. So these are the, 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 green, the green card holders. Uh, for employment, every single year they have 140,000 uh, visas. The, for the immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, there is no numbers. So they can, they, they can adjust pretty, pretty quickly. But if you're a legal permanent resident, uh, there's only those, like I said, 226,000 visas. So that poses a problem because most of the countries that bring uh, people here are, are legal permanent residents. It takes a while before you have the right to become a citizen. And uh, the number of visas allocated for them makes it really a long waiting time, if you see in the next slide. Next. So the, con the 12 countries that are le with at least 50,000 uh, waiting visas make up 78% of the applicant. So each of these countries is limited to 25,620 visas of last year. So Mexico has 1,309,000 people waiting for 25 1,620 visas. So imagine how many years if you're a Mexican citizen, uh, a Mexican legal permanent resident and want to have your family here. Uh, you know, there, if the kids, uh, like I, ha I have a case in New Hampshire that I'm pretty familiar with where the father immigrated here with their whole family. There were six kids. Uh, they were, both parents were legal permanent residents. They were not citizens. Uh, the children, the, he applied for the whole family. The children uh, turned 18 years of age before there was a visa number available for them. So they could not, they were taught out of, the, the second they become uh, adults, they, co they are out of the picture, so there was no way for them to adjust their status. The mother, after spending 26, 27 years here, uh, was caught driving without a license and she was deported, even though all her children in their 20s ha have been born here. Uh, but they, she is one of the victims of the, you know, the, the system that really they tried to do things the right way, but there was no visa available for them and she aged out of the application and there was no other way for her to adjust her status. So this is one of the reasons, in my opinion, why we failed you know, revamping the whole system is what we need so to prevent the cases of people being here undocumented because nobody chooses to be undocumented. There's just no path to citizenship. So let's go to the next, to the next slide. So example of wait times for US citizens, if they uh, petition for their spouse can take a, a year or so for a child or parent. If for a child over 21 is six years, uh, and Mexico is 21 years for, for if you're Mexican or from the Philippines because of the, the amount of uh, the amount of visas that they have uh, that they apply for. But to bring your spouse from Mexico, if they are from outside of the, if they are outside of the country, it can take up to six years or more. 
a child over 21, 10 years, I mean under 21, and if you're over 21, 15 to 17 years or, or more, can, it can take, you know. So the wait times are really long, and who, you know, in their right mind would want to just live here and leave all their family behind? Okay, next slide. So naturalization. Uh, permanent legal permanent residents have to wait five years after becoming legal permanent residents before they are eligible to, not to become uh, naturalized citizens. If you derive your, your permanent residency through marriage to a U.S. citizen, then you, the wait time is shortened to three years. Uh, and of course, you have to meet all the eligibility requirements. So they, they, do, they perform medical tests, they check your, your criminal background, you have to pass the you have to pass the written and oral uh, exams and the civics exam. So if you do all of that, then you're eligible to become a citizen. Also in the slide, uh, a child born outside of the U.S. might qualify to be a U.S. citizen. Like in my case, my children were born in Venezuela, but their father is American. So we went to the U.S. consulate in, in Venezuela. We registered them, and they were issued birth certificates as U.S. citizens born abroad. So that's a pretty common thing by, by the, the consulates do that. So um, also uh, children, uh, um, adopted children, uh, under 18, they follow a different, a different process, but they have, uh, they have the right to become citizens too. And those that have served in the military for at least one year, uh, they have the right to become naturalized citizens. So temporary protective status. Uh, right now, temporary protective status, um, okay, first let me tell you what. It's given to people, uh, to countries where there's ongoing, uh, no, just put the slide back. Yeah, where well, there's ongoing uh, conflict such as a civil war, so for example, El Salvador, got uh, TPS because of that. Or when, they, when there's an environmental disaster, like an earthquake or a hurricane or an epidemic, so a lot of the people from Haiti uh, got the, the TPS, uh, other extraordinary conditions. So what it gives them is they, they cannot uh, be removed from the United States, and they can uh, obtain the, the work authorization, and sometimes they can uh, travel outside of the country. Okay, next slide. So this is not a path to citizenship. The TPS is always temporary, although we have countries like Honduras and, uh, and Nicaragua that have, been, have, that have had the, the TPS for over 20 years. Uh, so, but it allows people to, to get their driver's licenses, to work here legally, to uh, they, it has to be renewed periodically, and they determine how, how long it can be renewed for, and it can also be terminated any time. The present administration right now uh, ended the TPS for seven, no, for five countries, and um, then a court put a stop to it, and then um, they, so right now they, they are still in a limbo, so we don't know what's going to happen uh, when, if something else is going to be presented. Like I said, immigration is always changing. Uh, it's really dynamic. It's really hard to keep up with, with it because every day we come with something, for something different. Okay, let's see. So these are the uh, countries that have temporary protective status right now. El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Okay, next. So by country, as you see, there's not, you know, in total in the whole country, there's 436,900 people. So it's not, it's not too many people for the, whole, for the whole country. You know, most of them are from El Salvador and then followed by Honduras and Haiti. Okay. So the Defer Action for Childhood Arrival, that's the DACA, that's for the youth. So what benefits it gives? It protects people from deportation, 
It gives them a work authorization and social security number so they can get their driver's license. You know how important it is for teenagers and young people to, to be able to drive. And they may request travel permission to, uh, to travel abroad, but uh, I think that has been undone. So they can no longer travel outside of the country. So limitations, again, this is not a permanent a permanent solution. So it's not a green card, which is the legal permanent residence, or a visa. So there's no path to citizenship. It's discretionary on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and uh, based on the, on the priorities of enforcement of, of the, the Homeland Secur Department of Homeland Security. So much has been talked about DACA. Uh, a lot of the beneficiaries of, of DACA, uh, you know, earn more money than their parents. They have become the, the primary wage earners in the family. They get uh, very good jobs. They are people that are perfectly assimilated to this country, if you will. They have been raised in the country. Uh, so they are, you know, they are Americans, if not for the piece of paper, uh, which is pretty sad that right now, personally, I, you know, talking as myself, it's pretty hard to see how these kids or these young people that have been raised here as Americans all of a sudden realize that they, they really have no right to be here, uh, no legal right to be here. And then they're being used by pawns on both sides of the aisle uh, for political gain. And so it, it, they have a really hard time uh, thinking about what it's going to happen to them, and most of them really have no ties to their countries of origin because uh, they, they have not been there uh, or lived there. So these are the requisites for DACA, so they're pretty tight. Not everybody qualifies. You have to be present in the country as of June of 15 of 2007. Uh, you have to have entered before uh, being 16 years old, born after June 15 of 1981, undocumented on June 15, 2012, which is when it was uh, implemented. You had to be in school or have graduated from high school, have no felony convictions and no more uh, than two misdemeanor convictions and no convictions of a significant misdemeanor. So it's, they're pretty tight, uh, they're pretty tight uh, rec rec requisites that they have. So the next that. So this is my New Hampshire, like, like I said, I work and I live in New Hampshire. So in New Hampshire, it's pretty small, the, the pool of uh, DACA children. Uh, there's uh, 400 people that have applied for DACA. There are probably more, but a lot of people did not feel comfortable giving all their information to the government. And uh, So ending DACA in our state alone uh, would cost $26.9 million annually in, in a gross, gross domestic product. So it is a significant contribution that, that these uh, young people uh, are um, making to, to our country. And if in a, in a small state that is traditionally not uh, an immigrant state like New Hampshire, look how, how much of a difference they're making. I cannot imagine what it is here in Massachusetts or in, in bigger states like California or other states where there's many, many more uh, young people that, that have benefited from, from DACA. So economically and educationally, they thrive nationwide. 63% uh, of the recipients move to better jobs, like I said, gaining greater access to employment that matches their education and their training. And they, they can grow in their jobs and, and get better conditions and they can work as professionals rather than the, the typical jobs that undocumented people do, the service jobs and the invisible jobs that nobody else wants to do. So this is a great chance for them to, to exercise and, uh, what they have learned in school and in their colleges and in their trainings in, in uh, to better their lives and, in turn, the lives of their own families by just showing them a, a different way of living. So next slide. So where are we for DACA? Okay. For those that have DACA, we've heard there was some going back and forth. Uh, they tried to stop it and then they put it again. And they, so right now, 
it continues uh, as before, except they can no longer apply to travel abroad. After several attempts to end the program, a judge has a order to continue accepting renewals, only renewals, so no more initial applications are accepted. Uh, the program will most likely be terminated unless legislation is passed after these midterm elections. So it's really important that, that we uh, advocate for, for those people to, to be granted some type of permanency and a path to citizenship uh, so they can continue living and contributing to, to our communities and our society, okay? So the public also supports DACA. In, in a survey in April of 2017 uh, of registered voters, 78% of the voters support giving DREAMers the chance to stay here permanently, including 73% of the, the people that voted for Trump. Only 14% four, of all the voters and 23% of those that support President Trump believe that the DREAMers should be deported. So they do have uh, a majority of the people that, that understand their situation and that support their, them staying here uh, and, and given a, a chance to, to become full citizens. So now we come to the undocumented immigrant. Who is an undocumented immigrant? A person present in the country without permission from the government. So people that enter illegally without being inspected by an immigration, so through a, no, not through a port of entry or a, an airport or a, a, a port. Uh, and those, there are a lot of people that have legal entries here with visas, with tourist visas, student visas, and they violated their visas. In other words, they overstayed their visa uh, past their expiration date. So not everybody that's here undocumented just snuck through the border. It's estimated roughly half and half. Half of the people that are here undocumented uh, came with, uh, without inspection, without a visa, and the other half are people that overstayed. And it's very common, you know, I came to college here in the 70s, and most of the people that, that I was in college with that were foreign students, we were all on visas. Uh, I, I married my husband, so that's the way I, I was able to to get uh, my green card and eventually become a citizen, but a lot of the people had no, no way to stay here, and, and they just decided to, to just stay. You know, it's really hard once you get used to, to living here and, and, and you learn all that, that you can do in, to, to decide to just pick up and live. That, that was my, my personal experience, and, and I know many people that, that were in that position, you know. And it's another loss because we're educating a pool of people that want to stay here, that have proven they can speak the language and that they can bring something to our economy. We're educating them, preparing them in the best universities, and then they have to, they have to go back home because there's no way for them to remain in the country legally. So let's go back to the slides. So undocumented population, and these are estimates really because there's not, you know, there's no census for undocumented. So 12, they said, they talk about 12 million people uh, being here, and like I said before, 50-50 enter without inspection, and, uh, and, all, and the other 50% came here uh, illegally, I mean legally. So they said 59% are from Mexico, but there are people from Asia, from all places, Latin America, South America, the Caribbean, uh, from Europe and Canada. Uh, in New Hampshire, we have uh, some population of Canadians because before 9-11, people used to go back and forth in the border to come to New Hampshire to work, Canadians. And now that they, re because there was no visa requirement, after 9-11, they put a visa. So a lot of the Canadians came that just stayed on the other side and are working there. And you know, I, we have large populations of people that you would really not identify as your traditional undocumented. But this is not a Mexican issue. Undocumented people from, come from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, including the white people that fly under the 
the radar more likely than not. Okay, next. So immigration, detention, and deportation. So who's in, in, in detention right now? Anybody undocumented? There are some legal permanent residents that have gotten into trouble or have been picked up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And also asylum seekers. Um, so we have all kinds of people there. Not everyone, not everyone that's in detention came here uh, undocumented. Uh, being held in detention, we have children, we have pregnant people, we have sick people, uh, people that have died with severe uh, health issues. Uh, so there's all kinds of people that are in detention right now. Next. So right now, there's uh, 34, we have a contract uh, of 34,000 beds every single day in detention in over 400 facilities across the country. So this is a $2 billion a year uh, endeavor, 50, 5, $5 million every single day. And we do have some uh, private uh, prisons, uh, for-profit prisons, that are part of those 400 facilities. So we're spending an awful lot of money uh, detaining people that are undocumented uh, or for, that have committed no crime just due to the immigration, uh, spending an awful lot of money yeah, in those facilities where we could just use that money for, to provide services in a more proactive way, different services with this. We have so much need in this country with everything, and then we're making people uh, rich by detaining people that have committed no crime. Okay, so in New Hampshire, they detain them in, in uh, Stratford County uh, Jail. So this is not a private prison corporation. Um, the, that's in Dover, New Hampshire, so they really uh, also, people that are in detention have no consideration for, uh, for attorneys. So they, they have to pay for their own attorneys. And also there's a lot of problems with some of those attorneys. They really don't do their job right, uh, and they don't take care of the people, and they're very expensive. Uh, so we need to do a lot of work making sure that some unscrupulous person does not get a hold of, of uh, people that are in detention and, uh, and just make money out of them and not, uh, not follow, the, the, not do a good job for them taking care of their, of their cases. Uh, these people can be moved without notices. We have people that are transferred to Alabama or, or Georgia or people that are transferred from Georgia and, or other places are transferred to New Hampshire, so they, they're continuously moving them, and it's a total nightmare for the families and their, to find out where the people have been transferred to. Uh, it's, that's really, it's really hard, and it's very taxing on the families to, to, to figure out where uh, how, and how to locate uh, their, their loved ones. Uh, in New Hampshire, we do, we're lucky enough to have an immigrant visitation program, so these people just bring comfort and come every week and talk to them and bring them resources. Uh, and basically just talk to them and, and make sure that, that they're doing okay and, and that, uh, that their rights are being upheld. We're pretty lucky in New Hampshire that the, the place where they're detained, even though it's, it's a jail and nobody wants to be in jail, and it's a decent, clean facility. and, and, and they, they treat them, the people in there, they treat them pretty well, uh, so they're not being abused like we hear in other, in other communities. Uh, and uh, it, I have been in there myself, and, and it's clean, and, and they have all kinds of different programs that, that the inmates can access. Okay, so let's move to the other, let's move to the other uh, next slide. So deportation is something like I tell, now, now people want to talk about immigration because of all the, the, it's an issue that has been highlighted by the present administration. But I have been working on immigration since I came to this country. And, and so 
deportations have always been there. Have, they have been pretty steady, but they, they just flew under the radar because people were not paying attention. If you were not an immigrant yourself, or you were not involved in immigration, uh, you did not um, have any reason to pay, to pay attention. So uh, now uh, people are beginning to realize that we have had so many uh, deportations. I have so many people over the, in my 30 years in New Hampshire, people that I care about and that work hard with me uh, that have been deported for no reason. Uh, so one of that, if I you know, can say it, is one of the good things that has come out right now in, the, in this present uh, administration is that people are paying attention. So let's go look at the numbers. Uh, there's over 2,800,000 2, immigrants have been deported since 2008. So, you know, the numbers have been pretty steady uh, all along. Uh, even uh, in, two, in 2012, there were almost a half million immigrants deported. In 2013, there was 368,000. Uh, in 14, 315,000. So deportations have been pretty steady. This is not a new thing, and this has nothing to do with any particular administration or political party. Uh, so I just want to leave that very clear, that this is not a, a political uh, thing, although, like I said, it, that this present administration has been particularly vocal about uh, immigration and, and treating immigrants in a different way. So let's go. So like I said before, the, uh, the immigration is re enforcement is very costly to our country. The, it's estimated that deporting 10 million undocumented immigrants would cost at least $206 billion over five years. And I don't know how that could be um, even implemented. Uh, heightened enforcement leaves communities living in fear of family separation. The children return home from school and find their, their parents have been removed. So they, their lives are in constant stress. Uh, in the communities in Manchester, we have had to go to churches and ask the parents to give power of attorneys to trusted family members or friends uh, and photocopy all the important documents of the children and their own documents. And, uh, and we have asked the, the, some of the churches to keep those documents for the family in case the parents don't, re don't uh, return back from, from work. So imagine the stress that, that these families are living in. The children are taught since they are very small not to open the door, not to talk about uh, their, their status or, or their parents. Uh, it, 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 and it affects also the American children. The other day I was speaking to, to a, a young girl from high school whose best friend's father was deported. And she said, what can we do? And I said, well, I'm sorry, there's really not much we can do. She said, all I do is cry because I see my friend so sad. And, and we just hugged each other and we cried. There's really not much we can do. So this is hurting a lot more people than, than just uh, the, the affected families. Let's put this slide uh, and finish it off. So economic and food insecurity is also a big, a big problem. A lot of the, the people that are deported are the men, so they are the main, main breadwinners in their home. Uh, most likely than not, their children are U.S. born. Uh, so these children are citizens and they, you know, when the father used to support them, uh, they had no problem, but now they, they don't know where they, if they have a meal. Uh, I have another, uh, another family pretty close to me that uh, their, the father was deported a few months ago, like three, four months ago, and the mother is very sick. Uh, the kids, you know, they're 11 years old and nine years old, and they don't know if they're going to eat. They don't, they don't own, they don't have uh, clothes for the winter. They, they, so I finally had to tell the mother, you know what? Right now, those kids have the right to 
to get food stamps. So now, you know, the government is going to have to, to support these children because the, 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 what the mother, even though she's very sick, she works, but she really works in a, in a low-paying job. So before, when the parent used to, the father used to take care of them, they had no need to, to access any benefits, but now they're going to have to start accessing benefits, and that goes across the board. Uh, if we keep deporting the breadwinners, we have to do something to, to take care of, of these people. So it's also an economic issue. Uh, they leave the apartments are vacant. Uh, the jobs, you know, the jobs that traditionally are held by, by undocumented immigrants, there, there's vacancies all over the place. So we do have an invisible economy that is supported mainly by the hands of the undocumented. And, and uh, we, we, don't, we take it for granted because we don't see it, but uh, it, it goes, it, it's a lot bigger than we think. So like we heard before, you know, uh, the families are having a really hard time uh, just getting reunified. Uh, the jobs are undermining income and housing. They, fa they face a stigma of criminal charges. This little boy I was just talking about, his neighbor was fighting with him the other day outside in the street, he, and he told him, I'm so happy that your father was deported. You went back and stuff, and he started insulting the kid. You know, that's pretty tough for, a, for an 11-year-old to have to, to deal with that. It's hard enough to, to deal with your own personal loss, but then to have somebody throw it in your face as an insult, that's pretty, pretty harsh. Uh, so we do have a lot of those problems coming up, and, and the children don't know how to react and what to do. So he called me crying, and I just said, just get in the house. Don't, don't engage yourself in, in any fights. But you know, it's pretty sad that, that kids are attacking each other like that. Let's finish this slide. So children are faced with the, with the decision of whether to return to a country they don't know or remain in the US. Uh, the whole family is left to join the deported father or in many cases, you know, they are split between countries. Usually the mother stays here and, and, the, and the father goes home and who knows when or if they are ever gonna see each other. Uh, I know a bunch of people from New Hampshire that were deported. So the parents, the fathers live on the side of Mexico and the mothers live in, in El Paso and they see each other on weekends, which is pretty sad too, but you know, that's what they had to do uh, to, to maintain some type of family unity, okay? So immigration enforcement leads to harsh penalties. The hardships are both economic and emotional are compounded by the long and arduous process. Parents are there in a limbo in, in immigration and all the stress uh, that the family have. So three out of five households report difficulty paying for food. Two of three parents reduce the size of their meals. Over half of the people ate less than before. And more than a fifth reporting having experienced hunger because they did not have enough to eat. That's according to the Urban Institute. So we, we really are in punishing the whole family for, for what, what the parent did. Okay, I think this is. So what are the big money items right now? We, there's talk about building the wall, increase border patrol by 5,000 officers, in, increase uh, immigration customs enforcement by 10,000 officers and uh, augment the bed space uh, in detention for all the immigrants uh, that are caught. But like I said, this comes and goes every day. There's something different. Uh, so I don't, nobody knows what's gonna happen. I suspect we're gonna have to wait for uh, after these uh, midterm elections to figure out if anything is really going to, to stick, okay? Uh, so, Right now, the priorities in immigration, they wanted to end DACA, manage the children at the border fleeing violence, the, tighten the asylum loophole. Asylum is very hard to get, and now they want to make it uh, harder, so raise the standard for credible fear. 
uh, beef of enforcement or fast track deportations and indefinite detention, hire the ICE officers and extra prosecutors, um, make the local police departments compel them to cooperate with ICE. So they don't want any sanctuaries and they want police departments to act as ICE agents. Reduce what they call the chain migration, which is basically the family-based migration and in, in, in uh, exchange, an exchange for a point system or merit system and end the TPS for seven countries. Next, Next slide. So what do we do? We need to call our legislators, tell them to pass a Clean Dream Act and to reform our present immigration system that is proven for many years that is no longer working. Uh, enforcement alone is not the answer. Establish conversations with churches uh, about sanctuary in all the different levels. So we have sanctuaries, churches uh, that, are, that are willing to house people that have a chance of, uh, of attaining some type of, uh, some type of status, but usually the, the enforcement side and the proactive side or the visa side, they don't communicate well. And many times a person is undocumented while they have a pending case uh, application in the in the visa side, but they get deported before before the visa side uh, has the application has the chance to advance through the court system, and that takes a lot of uh, that takes a lot of time. So we, you know those are good, would be good candidates for sanctuary. So there's a big sanctuary network. They're mostly churches, and uh, they have agreed to house. Uh, some of these people, and the other churches are just support systems, so they will provide the food, the transportation, and anything else needed. So there is a big network of, of sanctuary. Uh, this, we need to just open the doors for more presentations like this. I shorten it severely, and I try not to make too many comments. Uh, but I go wherever I'm asked to go, in churches, basements, libraries, wherever, so people understand the reality of immigration and why we are where we are. So if you have a contact uh, or you would like to have a presentation in, in person, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, we have uh, vigils in front of us. Every time somebody that uh, is in uh, removal uh, in procedures that has to check in in ICE because a lot of people were not a priority before, even though they were already in the system. So they have been checking in periodically on ICE. So every time we go, uh, somebody is checking in, we go there and have a respectful, prayerful vigil in front of the ICE office. But the deportation is not the solution. We need to change the laws. And that's all. I hope you learned a little bit. And thank you very much for your attention. You can contact me uh, at, in the, the website and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.